you are our 10,000th viewer and you have won one million dollars. All you have to do is click on this link, fill in your information, give us your name, your address, your home phone number, your social security number, your bank routing information, and your mother's maiden name. What do you mean you think it's a scam? You're not going to give me the information. Well, fine. I'll just give it to the next viewer. Meanwhile, I have to tell you, your car's extended warranty is about to expire, so you better see me about that. That's all for now. I gotta go. <laughs>
and return a portion of it to God, we are also supposed to use our talents for God. We are supposed to invest them in his kingdom. In today's sermon, Pastor Myron is going to be talking about tithing. Tithing is when we take a portion of the money that God has given us and give it back to him. All of our money and all of our talents come from God, so we should be willing to use them for his purposes. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. So that's your challenge this week. Don't waste your money on golden toilet paper. And don't waste your talents that God has given you. And instead, invest them in God and see what blessings he returns. Have a great week! Good morning, Penn Forest Worship Center. It is me, Pastor Heather. I am uh, not coming to you live, but I am coming to you from Tennessee. You can see the sun is setting behind me as I record this, and I've slipped away to spend some time with my parents. I am looking forward to some time spending with my parents, just enjoying their company and enjoying this little slice of heaven up here on top of the mountain. Just a few announcements this week. We will be back on campus on Wednesday nights, the youth, the teens, and the adults, uh, respectively. We're going to be outside, the, those of us who are under 18, um, if it's nice, um, or we'll be in the youth room or the fellowship hall, respectively. The adults will be in the sanctuary, so make sure that you join us for that. And be on the lookout. If you have not picked up a newsletter, um, please let us know. We would love to get that for you. Also, Pastor Paul sends out an email every single Monday with what's coming on, uh, what's coming up with the calendar. As we are seeing um, more and more reopening, we've added some things to our calendar, and we want to make sure that you know about them. So if you do not get those emails, call the church office or um, drop us an email. And we'll make sure that we get you added to that list. Would you bow with your head with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have together to worship corporately. I thank you for the time that we had together last week to worship in this and to be together Easter to celebrate um, your resurrection. Lord, I thank you for the families that we have, those that God gave us, our biological family, and those that God gave us that are not our biological family, Lord. May we just look around and see who is part of our family unit that may not be biological, Lord, but just may be the one that God has placed, uh, that you have placed for us just to um, nurture and to love and to care for, Lord. I'm so thankful for the family that I have, both my biological family, Lord, and the family that you gave me here at Penn Forest. And so I just, um, I thank you for, for all that we have, Lord. Just be with us in this service. Be with Pastor Myra as he bring the, brings the word. Be with the worship music. Be with, um, just be in this place, Lord. Be where we can see you and feel you and just know that you are moving within our midst. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. And now, if you're able, please stand.
Father in heaven, I thank you. Thank you for the beauty of your creation. Thank you for all that you have given to us. Thank you for your forgiveness of sins. Father, we don't, we don't evaluate enough and seek your repentance. And right here in this moment, right now, I ask that you would just forgive us. Forgive us for the, those intentional sins and the unintentional sins. Forgive us for not behaving the way you've called us to behave. Forgive us for neglecting to reach out to those in need. Forgive us for neglecting to give your tithes and our offerings. Forgive us for neglecting our families. Forgive us for neglecting to spend the time in your word. Forgive us, Father. May we, had an may we have an attitude of repentance this day to seek you, humble ourselves over and over again throughout the Old Testament. You have challenged us to be humble before you. And so the, this morning, Father, may we humble ourselves before you. May we bow in our hearts in your presence and seek you. Thank you for doing it. And right now, Lord, I ask that you would just speak boldly to each and every person that is listening to this, whether on campus uh, or via Facebook or YouTube, speak to them, Father, and do a, a transformation in each of our lives. For those who need a touch physically, touch them physically. For those who need a touch spiritually, do that and just intervene. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining with us this day. It is so good to have you with us, uh, whether you are worshiping here on campus or on uh, Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for joining with us. I want to encourage you, as we are seeing more and more people vaccinated, to come and start making a habit to get back in church. It's easy to get in the habit of just sitting at home and, and watching it on your TV or on your phone or on your computer, but I encourage you, come. You, if you don't feel comfortable gathering with people yet, then come to the parking lot. Uh, we have chairs set up outside if it's a nice day, uh, and we put a speaker out there, we open the blinds, I can actually see and interact a little bit, uh, and we have it transmitted on FM 102.9, and we encourage you to come. Start getting back in the habit of coming to church. Hey, uh, we have been raising funds for our Make a Difference campaign uh, to put a new heat pump back in the office area because we have been without heat or air conditioning uh, for several months now since about December, November, December. And uh, I am thrilled to report that this weekend uh, the heat pump was installed. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, we have been raising funds. We had enough to be able to install the heat pump. And so thank you for your generosity and obedience. And lights for the gym have been ordered. What is really interesting and neat to me is there are a couple individuals I know of who live in Northern Virginia that do not attend this church, but this church impacted them. And between the two of them, they gave $1,300 towards our Make a Difference fundraiser to uh, put lights in the gym and get the heat pump. So that's pretty incredible. God is still working in people's lives. Even though they may not live here, we see how we have planted seeds, we have fertilized, we have watered, we have been obedient, and God has worked in those individuals' lives to the point where they have given funds to help make a difference here at Penn Forest. That's awesome. So if you have not given yet, I encourage you to give. You know, if every family in the church were to give something above and beyond their regular tithes and offerings, we could reach our goal of $10,000. Thank you so much for your obedience and generosity. All right, now then, today we are closing out the Old Testament book and our, and our journey through the Bible. We are closing out the Old Testament. We're finishing up, and this Wednesday night, we will be finishing up uh, and with... Uh, Malachi as well. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Malachi chapter 3, Malachi 
chapter 3. We're going to be looking at that. This is the last book in the Old Testament. And then we're going to take a little bit of a break during the month of May. And uh, we are going to jump in uh, to uh, the New Testament come June. So I encourage you to be a part. There are some exciting stuff. I have learned so much over this past year and a half, almost two years that we've been digging into the Old Testament. And now I'm excited about the fact that we're going to be moving forward into the New Testament and digging into it. That's going to be exciting. And we get into even more uh, details on Wednesday night. So I encourage you to come and be a part of our Wednesday night. If you're not able to join us in person, then join us via Zoom. Uh, We are on Zoom on Wednesday nights for our Bible studies. So uh, come and join us. All right. Today, we're talking about releasing the leash. Releasing the leash. Now then, uh, have you ever seen someone using a leash on a child? Some people get all bit out of shape when they see individuals having a child on a leash. The internet has all sorts of stories with people criticizing parents who use a leash. They think they should teach their children just to obey. And there are stories about parents dragging their kids through the malls and and all sorts of places, through a zoo and and everything. And and, uh, other parents are just outraged and say, you should teach your child to behave. Well, that's easier said than done. When you have an ADHD to the hilt child, that's a little bit challenging. You know, we all know toddlers can be a handful at times. Amen? Yeah, they can. And if you go to an amusement park, you can certainly uh, lose them in just a moment uh, when, when you don't want to be losing them. You can look away for a second and there's so many things buying for their attention, they just go running off and you don't realize it. I have some good news, some good news if you're one of those parents who are inclined to use one. They appear to be safe because there is not much data that points to children's leashes being a cause of injury in and of themselves. So there you go. Go ahead and use your leash on your child. Aside from not wanting to lose your toddler, I found a humorous reason why parents should use them on their sons. Okay, remember, this is a humorous reason, so you have to laugh, all right? Are you going to laugh with me? They wrote, one of the more obvious reasons for keeping a boy on a short leash from an early age is great preparation for the eventual married life. (laughs) Uh, See, I told you. Uh, Just kidding, just kidding. The point is that the child has limits. They're limited in their freedoms. But who really is in control? There are limits that are all around us. There are spending limits that are put out there. There are speeding limits, earning limits, noise limits, eating limits, off-limit places, and the list goes on and on. And today I want to remind you that our God, our God is limitless in his power and in his ability. There is nothing he can do. Our God is almighty. The degree to which we experience his power and ability depends entirely upon the length of the leash we've attached to him. Did you catch that? There is nothing that he cannot do. Our God is almighty. The degree to which we experience his power and ability determines or depends entirely upon the length of leash we've attached to him. Have you attached a leash to God? I want to challenge you this morning to take him off the leash, to take him off the leash and allow him to have the freedom to work in and through your life. We serve a God who is infinite, all power, all knowing, completely capable, and his love knows no limits. Yet even though we know this and often declare it, we tend to limit the power of God. That is precisely, that is precisely what the people of Judah did over and over again. Psalms chapter 78 verses 41 and 42 says, Again and again they tested God's patience and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power and how He rescued them 
from their enemies. Hmm. Sounds like we're quite a bit like the Israelites and the people of Judah. This morning, as we look at Malachi, we will see that he is challenging them, the people of Judah, uh, to not limit him, to take the limits off, to believe that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we could ever ask or even imagine. He is challenging them to take off the leash. Malachi, uh, the prophet, he served as a prophet for Judah from around, around the time of 430 B.C. He was the last Old Testament prophet, wow, that we have record of. And then there is 400 years of silence. The city of Jerusalem and the temple had been rebuilt for almost 100 years. But the people had become complacent. They become complacent in their worship. Their relationship with God had become broken because of sin. Sin has devastating consequences in our lives. Have you noticed a reoccurring theme throughout the Old Testament? Again and again, the people of Israel and the people of Judah, they, they would sin and then they would come back and they would repent. Then they would drift away and become complacent and sin. And, and then there would be a prophet that would come and speak to them and draw them back. And so this morning, I'm calling you to repentance, to come back, to come back to a, to a, a place where you are radically committed to Jesus Christ, where you're committed to him, where you've released the leash and are letting him work in your lives. So if you have your Bibles open to Malachi chapter 3, we're going to begin with verse 6 and read through verse 12. I am the Lord and I do not change. This is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. This is God speaking. Verse continuing on. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Mm. They thought they were still right there. Think about that. Verse 8. God answers, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? God responds, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all of the tithes, verse 10, bring all of the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Verse 11. Your crops will be abundant and I will guard them from insects and diseases. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord. Then all the nations, then all the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Hmm. Over and over, says the Lord of heaven's armies. It says over and over, says the Lord of heaven's armies. This is God speaking. One of the ways that we put a leash on God is through our giving. I firmly believe that stewardship, tithing, is a hard issue. It always has been and always will be. Stewardship, tithing, is a hard issue. God wants, you, wants to put more into your heart than he wants to take out of your paycheck or your wallet. Did you catch that, church? 
God wants to put more into your heart than he wants to take out of your paycheck and wallet. Let me say that one more time. God wants to put more in your heart than he wants to take out of your paycheck or your wallet. Unfortunately, in many churches, stewardship emphasis centers around the aspect of the church needing more money. We preachers make statements like, if everyone tithed, we'd never have to worry about money. And I've even said that myself before. It is true. <laughs> if everyone tithed, we would, we would have all sorts of funds to do all sorts of ministry. But where in God's word does it ever say that I as a pastor or that we as a, his church are to worry about money? He doesn't. God says just the opposite. He says, do not worry. Do not worry. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, it says, this is why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? When life and possessions become our goal, when life and possessions become our goal, the relationship with God is hampered. I'm going to say this one more time. You check it out right here on the screen. When life and possession becomes our goal, our relationship with God is hampered. Treasures of earth, they grip us. They hold on to us. They seize our feelings. They seize our affections. And they, they hold on with an iron grip, not letting go. Let someone try to take them from us and we become bitter. We become angry and we become even violent. What you treasure is where your heart is. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters for he will either hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You can't serve God and be enslaved to money. The truth of the passage is we are going to serve something. Did you catch that? We are going to serve something. If a material mindset controls us, if a material mindset controls us, then we are really godless, even though we talk about God all the time. Mm. We must ask ourselves today, who am I serving? Matthew 6, says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. Seek God first. Seek God first. It's simple. It's profound. It's even part of our, our mission statement here at the church. Relentlessly pursuing God. Seek God first. Those here in Malachi, they're a living testimony of materialism. Being, they, they treasured materialism. They served materialism. They sought materialism. And there are two mistakes Two mistaken views of Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You've cheated me of your tithes, or my tithes and offerings that are due to me. The first mistaken view is to give tithes and offerings and then say God owes me I can do whatever I want with the 90% that's a mistaken view to say well I gave my tithe I can do whatever I want with the other 90% and a second mistaken view is I am no longer under the law but grace so I don't have to heed the command that, that God wants us to tithe often this passage is abused by well-meaning pastors and teachers and they are, they are plugged into the needing money syndrome. Give, 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 give. Using the passage to guilt people.
people into giving. However, a closer examination of this passage will prove itself to be that there's more. During the time of the prophet Malachi, the people of Judah were focused on, on a new God. They're focused on a new God. Their lives were consumed with the treasure of money and serving money and seeking money. So the prophet, of, prophet Malachi issued a call to return to God. Tithing, too, often becomes this most critical part of the passage, but the most critical part of their heart or of their lives and ours was obedience. God was wanting them to turn back to him in obedience. Do we trust God enough to obey him? Do we trust God enough to obey him? Did you catch that, church? Do we, you and me, trust God enough to obey him? Remember about, excuse me, remember Malachi chapter 3, verse 7? It says, ever since the days of the, your ancestors, hmm, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Hmm. But you ask, how can we return to you and we've never gone away? The prophet is calling the people. He's calling them to repentance, to return to God. There is an extraordinarily close relationship between giving and repentance. There's a very close relationship between giving and repentance. Malachi says, return to God. The people ask, how? And Malachi says, in effect, start with the most visible sin in your life, your money. Start with the most visible sin in your life, your money. If the Christian does not tithe, the need is not for more money. The actual need is for repentance. Let me say that again. If a Christian does not tithe, the need is not for more money. The need is for repentance. The people piously ask, why do we need to repent? To which Malachi responded with the question, will a man rob God? Can we rob God? Is that possible? The word rob, let's get into the Hebrew just a little bit. The word rob is from the same root word for Jacob, which means to deceive, always taking from people. So to rob God is to take what is rightfully his. So to rob God is to take what is rightfully his. Now we must decide. We must decide, church. Is it God's money or is it mine? Is it God's money or is it mine? God doesn't need our tithes and offerings. As the late Bobby Batten used to say when we'd be praying over our finances, he would say, God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. I know he'll take care of us. Basically, he says, he was saying, God doesn't need our tithes and offerings, but he wants our obedience. God wants our obedience. The truth is, God has laid a claim to the tithe for our benefit, for yours and mine. He wants us to be free from the destructive God of money. Our God is almighty. His power and his ability is limitless. There is nothing he cannot do. The degree to which we experience his power and ability in our lives depends entirely upon whether we are going to let go of the leash that we've attached to him. And this morning I want to challenge you to release the leash. Release the leash. When you release the leash, you'll understand that verse that says, my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you could ever ask or even 
imagine according to his work that is going on within you. To willingly, freely, and joyfully give him the tithes and offerings, his tithes and our offerings, allows us to treasure, serve, and seek him through obedience. He desires that you and I treasure him over money. He is more important than the things of this world. Serve him over money and seek him over money. This morning, will you release the leash? Will you begin to trust God? Because stewardship is a hard issue. Have you given God all of your heart? Yes, it can be challenging. Our flesh cries out and says, Oh, as I give this tithe, uh, whether it be $20 or $50 or, or $100, whatever that tithe is, or some more. We start thinking and Satan starts sitting on our shoulder and starts saying, do you know what you could do with that? That could pay the electric bill. But God says, test me in this. Do you trust him enough to walk in obedience to him this morning? Will you release the leash and allow him to work in some incredible ways in your life, doing exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or even begin to imagine. Father, thank you for being with us this morning. And I pray that beyond the words that I speak and spoke, that your Holy Spirit will be speaking to hearts and lives. May individuals seek your face in repentance and begin to walk in obedience to you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have given to us. We love you, Father, and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, early on in my ministry, I used to find it very challenging to talk about tithing and giving because I felt like it was guilting people. And what I realized by not talking about tithing and giving, that I was robbing people. I was robbing people of blessings. The blessing and the honor and the obedience of giving. And I was being disobedient to God. And so now, I preach about it. Unapologetically, God does call us to give in obedience. And I encourage you to step out in faith, to test him in this, and give him control of even your finances because it is a heart issue and now if you would bow your heads for the Lord's blessings and now may the blessings of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you may he rekindle within you a heart of love and obedience as you relentlessly pursue him and the people that he loves. May the same power who raised Jesus from the grave live in you. And may his peace go with you this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining with us this day. Have an incredible week and God bless.